Hey everyone, welcome to my next video. And in this one, I'm gonna again continue on my build series because this is what I've been apparently infatuated with the, the past few months. And this video especially has been on my mind for at least, as you can see here, two months since I created this new repository, which I'm gonna introduce to you uh, in this video. And why did I create yet another st 32 build repository? Well, let's start with an introduction. So here is when I search for a different packages for the ARM embedded toolchain. Well, my coworker compiled my project, but it failed because, well, the C++ version was not compatible. But he was running uh, uh, Debian with some other re package repository, but I'm running Fedora 35 on my work computer. So what's the deal? Well, if you look here, the Debian 10 houses the version 7 of the ARM toolchain, which is quite old. It's version 2018. And a bit newer, 20, uh, Debian 11 houses just <laughs> version 8. Now the Ubuntu 20.04, which is quite ubiquitous, houses a bit newer version 9, which can support a few C++ 20 features, which were really crucial on our project, but not all of them. So thankfully in the newest release 22.04, it supports the 10.3, which is great. But if you look at the different name of this, uh, the same package group on Arch Linux, they already have the version 12 geez, and on Fedora 35, which is what I use, uh, it's version 11, which is quite new and it's very great. And what's the problem here? So we have different repositories for different operating systems, in this case, Linux distributions, and they all have different repository for the ARM embedded toolchain. So if you're sharing your code between different people and you're using as myself quite the newest C++ uh, 20 features and C++ 23 is coming soon, then there can be a bit of compatibility issue if you just post your raw repository online and people can't compile it because they have some weird issues. Well, in that case, you could resort to going to the ARMS toolchain website which is this link over here, and they house the version 10.3 over here as of now. Um, but you can download the raw repository over here and install it manually on your system, which I'm gonna go to uh, it in the future. And this is all and well, but you might wanna have a different repository or some other tools and they're not compatible because different people have different computers. So what can we do about this? Well, one, in one of the videos, I described how to use CMake. So this is a bit homogenizing the, the raw building part of the st 32 And then I created a repository for it, which has some traffic, which is quite nice. And it's really basic. It's just the st 32 project along with a few CMake files like the CMake, the helper make file and the toolchain file over here. And I've also added a bit of Nix for myself over here, but the readme is short and concise, uh, displaying different versions, how different operating systems and distributions install different packages and how they're called differently. And then a few commands and that's it. But the versioning part bothered me, so I created this new repository, which kind of stems from this video when I started to talking about this st 32 CMake project. And then in the later video, when I started uh, talking about how you can uh, build this, the same project on Windows. And in this state of this repository, it had a few links which were not compatible on Windows, so you could not use it really natively. And it also had a few problems of the certain make commands that were not compatible on Windows as well. So now we have also the Windows Linux issue. And let's just bring all the people together and create one big repository just called STM32. So it's quite simply go to my GitHub pretzel slash STM32 and you can find this repository. And I've prepared a little bit. I've created lots of examples. I've created documentation. I also included the license file, which is quite fancy if you ask me. And I've also added a tag. So I have a release tag version 1.0 with a short uh, uh, explanation when you can download it as a release file or you can just check out onto the release branch so you can just git checkout version 1.0 and it will take you to the correct commit and as of now this is the latest one so the tag version 1.0 is currently pointing to the head as of today but when I add a few things to this repository and you're watching these videos a few months after this has been posted 
then you can just check out the correct version of this repository and it will be the same as in this video right now. Now the goal of this video is to traverse to this a bit bigger repository and a few files can gain weight, especially the make file. And we're gonna go through the things that stayed the same and the things that have changed and the things that I have added. So the first thing I would like to advise you to is read at least the first README, uh, which describes the, uh, the intent of this repository and where you can find different uh, instructions and different README as well. Because I've also added a docs folder, which houses a bunch of other markdown files with a different readmes. So here we have a bit of introduction into this repository. Then we have an explanation of the example that is currently running, which is running on the F4 discovery board. And it's currently just blinking the blue LED and printing hello world over the SWO, which is already connected to this board via the debugger. I'm not using uh, printing hello world over UART because the UART is not connected on this version of development board. But if yours have, then please use it. Then the most important part is a workflow which describes the way you go about building your repository. Because building with CMake is still the same as in the previous videos and, and the files have been just copied and just a little bit modified. But the way you go about building that can be different. So there are three ways as of now and the first one is native and the second one is using Docker or any containerization platform and the third way is using the provided flake.nix. Well, there's actually a fourth one, which is just using the same computer for the entire project team, but that's not really useful, is it? Then I described the code style. Well, I'm using the Clang format, which is a useful tool from the Clang family, uh, which uses the .clang format file, which is also housed in this repository over here. And this just sets up a few rules on how the code should look. And it's very useful before you commit any changes to just run the Clang format, which in my case just finds every C, H, and CPP and HPP file in this repository. So this is including the STM32 peripherals and it's just gonna format all of them. You can also find this uh, execution command later in the make files. Also, I provided a few files that were for myself pr uh, primarily uh, because there are a few commands that I've been returning to from time to time and I forgot uh, 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 the option or a command or two. And a few code tips when I was debugging, I was continuously researching the Google for uh, the, uh, these commands and I just got tired of it and I created two tooltips which, which we are also going to take a look in. Uh, which house a few of these files as well, and they might be helpful for you as well. So now let's stop rambling and let's go to look into this repository and see what it's all about. So I have terminal opened here with my repository cloned. And as you can see, my Starship uh, uh, prompt is giving me the git commit and the tag version, which as you can see, I'm already checked out at the version 1.0, which is also the head. So if you're doing this on your computer at a later date, you can just type git checkout. Oh, and you just type in version 1.0. In this case, you will check it out to the version 1.0 commit. And this is what the git will tell you. But this is also the head as of this video. So we have a bunch of these files and let's firstly go through ones that are the same as before and then we traverse through the ones that were modified and the ones that were added and why so. So we still have the core files, the cubemix and the drivers and the project. So these are the raw folders that house all of the information about the code. So the core is from the st 32 that houses the main, which we're going to have a take a look at, which is running the example. The cubemx is housing the default make file provided to by the cubemx, which was described in the previous videos, the startup and the linker script. Okay. The drivers houses all of the drivers. Uh, these were not touched. These were again provided by STM32 cubemx. And the project files contain the project main, uh, header and the source file and the SWO, which is in C. So this is the one that is using for printing hello world over the SWO. So you have a few different functions, but I'm using this one, which is just printing uh, the string over the SWO. On the default port, I think it's the port zero. 
Then we have the CMake list, the exact list in the previous video. Then we have the make file, which is a little bit plumped. It's quite big right now. We have the .ioc file, which is for the Cubamax, and we have the toolchain file, which is the same as before. Okay, then we have the readme and the docs repository, which together work to create this uh, readme repository, which we're gonna traverse through. So let's navigate to the workflows part and go with the first one. So the first part of the workflow is the native build. So the native build, uh, as I've defined it, is the way that you install all your dependencies on your computer when you're working and compiling your project and then use it to create binaries, deploy the project and so on. So what it does, well, it's easy to use because you can just install all the hardware and software and it's ready for development on your IDE because your IDE will find all of the libraries and source files and headers on your system. And it's great for debugging and for uh, testing and when you're beginning, when you're learning, this is really great and easy to use. But it has a few downsides. Well, the first one is that you have to have your dependencies installed globally on your system or the more technical reason is you have to have them in your path. So they're available at all times. Well, uh, this can be problematic when you're working in a team or when you're sharing some specific software that requires some specific versions of certain tools that when you're collaborating with different people and they have different operating systems, different Linux distributions, they have different packages as you saw in the beginning. That's not really great. So I wouldn't, for my personal opinion, advise this for sharing any bigger projects just like that, when you're just saying, please install this set of tools and you're go, because that's not the case always. So I just recommend this for individual development and solo release, or if you're creating just a small project that doesn't really rely on any specific versions uh, of different tools. And now when we have that out of the way, let's go to the dependency list. Well, of course, we're going to need the CMake and Make for building the actual project, the ARM Embedded Toolchain. And uh, please check out on your repositories whether it's called GCC ARM Non Embedded or just GCC ARM Embedded or ARM Non EAB GCC. And sometimes, like on Fedora, some parts of the toolchain are uh, sold separately. So the new lib, which is the C uh, library replacement, is as a separate tool. And the binutils is also a separate package. So you have to install that as well, or else your project will not compile. The Clang tools is optional, but I use it for the Clang format, for formatting, and the uh, uh, Clang tidy from time to time. So what is the workflow when you have your native development tools? Well, you use the same make file that I provided before with these four commands. So if you just run make, the defaults to building the project with the provided threads. So if you just type in make, it will uh, compile on one thread. But if you gave it the J flag, it will compile with all. Or if you give it a number, it will compile with as many threads as you provide it. The make clean will clean the folder and make the CMake will just rerun the CMake. So you can use this make file more as of a helper script, so you can avoid typing long commands manually. But it does a little bit more than that. It simplifies to a single tool that you can install on most operating systems and Linux distributions, and its version isn't that important. But the make file does a little bit more for this particular repository for differentiating between different uh, operating systems like Windows and Linux. If you want to avoid using the makefile, of course, you can do everything on your own. So you can see that the CMake commit is quite long and you have to modify it, just a little bit of it if you have a different operating system. So in this case, for Linux, you have to provide it with the generator option of Unix makefiles. But on Windows, this is going to be MinGW makefiles. Or if you're using Ninja or any other build tool, then you have to replace it with the appropriate name over here. And if you want to compile your project, you can just uh, run make with the C options into the C, uh, into the build repository that was created by the CMake and it will uh, compile it with no problems. Or you can uh, omit the build tool that you're using and just call CMake again with the build flag and the folder in which the build folder is being built and it will run the appropriate build tool regardless of what you chose. So if you chose over here Ninja, then over here it's gonna run Ninja. So you don't have to remember which build tool you're using. But now let's take a look at the make file, which is the reason why I've created it. So let's go back here and let's open it. 
So this make file, as I said, has gained weight from the previous uh, videos and previous repositories. And it's not shaming, uh, it has its own purpose. But as I said before, not all the files that are in this repository and not all the content in those files is needed for your particular project. And if it's not, you can remove it. So in this case, I have a few variables on the top and this is one change from the previous times as of now the firmware name or the project name that's going to be built so something.bin depends on this make file so in your cmake configuration you also have to provide it with the name so let's also open the cmake lists and this is right at the beginning so at the beginning you set the project name and as you can see it expands a variable which is different from before because before i had the default name like firmware well, it's exactly the same as here, but I defined it from this make file over here. So when we pass it into the CMake configurations over here, we pass it with the variable expansion over here. So if you're not a fan of that, if you want to set the project name in the CMake file, then you can just omit this make option and here replace it with the project name. So if you just want to create the project name firmware, you can delete this and type in firmware. So this is what I want you to be aware of. There are also a few options like CMake export compile, compile commands, which is currently by default on. So you can use this file for all the IDEs. The toolchain file is self-explanatory. The build type and the build dir are also important, which is on the top. And the generator, which is what the CMake will generate for. So I'm using make, therefore I'm by default using the Unix make files on the Unix platform. And if you're Windows, this is what this if stated miss for. If you're using Windows, it's going to use the MinGW make files, which is, makes sense. And this is what this part here, if you're wondering, this is just detecting the operating system. On Windows, this OS will expand into Windows NT. On Linux, it will expand into nothing. And if it expands into nothing, it's going to uh, populate the name of your current Unix uh, operating system. In case of Linux, it's going to platform Linux. This part is quite the same as before, also the Clang formatting part is quite the same, but I've also now added a bit of uh, flashing part as well. So in the previous video I described four ways of, or five ways of building your project and flashing it into your repository, and I've included two of them here. So the ST flash and the JLink. So if you're using ST flash, you just have to make sure that your project is built successfully and then just flash it onto your microcontroller. So here we run the ST flash command that writes into the default flash location on the ST32. And here is the location of the binary file once it's built. And as I found out just right now, I already have the firmware expanded variable, which will be the build directory and the project name dot bin. But what the hell, so you can just replace this with the firmware expander. Also the JLink is over here, so the JLink is an interactive tool, but you can provide it with a script and it will traverse a text file with different commands and execute them so you don't have to do it manually by hand. So just uh, here create this script file inside of the build directory, so once you run make clean, it also disappears. So this is for the native make file. So it's quite larger, but if you're using Windows then, or Linux and decide on what platform you're using, you can just destroy these uh, lines and just replace this line over here with uh, either Unix make files or MinGW or Ninja or whatever. So you don't need these lines over here. Others, uh, of course, if you're not using any of these build uh, flashing tools, then you're already gonna omit these lines anyways. So that's for the make file. So it's quite similar to before, but I added a few things to make it either platform compatible uh, for Windows and Linux, and also I've added some flashing examples so you can follow them along. So let's give, of course, a demonstration. So let's clean this terminal. So again, if we run make clean, just to make sure that everything is empty, it cleans. And if you run make with eight threads, it will firstly uh, launch the CMake with this large command. And then it will uh, compile the project, export the elf, and this is it. And if I run it again, it will know that it's already built. So inside the build directory, we have the firmware.bin, firmware.elf, the map file, and the compile commands, which can be used by your IDE, like VS Code. Also, we can just run this command manually. So let's just copy it over here 
and paste it over here. Oh, round clipboard and run it. So we just ran it manually. And then, as I said before, you can just run it with the build and the <laughs> history is already here. And you don't need to specify the build tour. So if you're using make, okay, it's gonna launch make, but if you're using Ninja, well, it's gonna use Ninja. So it doesn't care. Uh, but you could also use clean, configure it again, and just run make with the C option. So it's gonna build in another directory with eight threads and it's not gonna print the different messages. And this is gonna do quite the same. So this is for the native part, which is quite similar. So my computer is quite special because I'm running NixOS, which means that none of the executables or a limited amount of executables are global and in my path, but currently all my tools are specified in my path. So my compiler is in path. So if, if I tap arm non EAB GCC version, you can see I'm running 10.3.1 and the CMake I'm running 3.22 and for make, I'm running the version 4.3 and also clang format, I'm running the version 13. And let's give an example of clang format. So just run make uh, format and give it, let's say 14 threads. And as you can see, it went through all the source files in the repository. So all the drivers, all the core, and also my project specifics. So if I have any diff, you're gonna see it right now. So apparently a few things changed since the last time I formatted this. And in this case, it's just one file. Now, of course, because I've claimed that this method is cross-platform, I also gonna demonstrate it on Windows. So here I have my wi uh, Windows virtual machine and it's the same one as in the previous video. So I only have all the tools installed. So if I run on EAB GCC version, I have the 10.3.1. I also have make, which is currently just an alias. So it, uh, if I type tile type make, you can see it's an alias to mingw32 make. And I also have uh, CMake version 3.23, oh, much, much newer than on Windows. So uh, this is the same repository. If we go into the log, you can see that I'm on the tag version 1.0, but just to be sure, let's uh, check out to 1.0 so as you can see my terminal is giving me that i'm on 1.0 which is great so let's just type in make and give it i think it has four threads only so the first thing is gonna run the uh the cmake and as you can see it ran with the correct option so in this case it detected it's on windows so it detected the mingw make files and then it ran the compiler and it built successfully and all the previous uh, command without using the make will still work. The uh, the formatting part will not work because I don't have the Clank format installed on this Windows virtual machine. But if you manage to get it installed, then you can use it much the same way. Now I would like to go to the second way, which is using a container tool like Docker or Podman. In case you're not uh, familiar with these tools, they're quite ubiquitous in the development world, especially on the web development. And Docker is a tool that creates a small lightweight virtual machines separate from your computer, but they're using your current computer's resources. More specifically, they're running on Linux, more lightweight than the virtual machine on Windows that I'm using right here, where I'm emulating or uh, virtualizing the entire operating system. And that's why the Docker is so beloved, because you can launch lots and lots of virtual machines at a time without many performance costs. And the one thing that is really handy with them is that you can create those virtual machines and share them with other people so they can create them by themselves. And that's called with the Docker files. Now, an alternative to Docker is called Podman, which is using the same architecture and it's using the quite the same uh, uh, syntax. So when you're using Docker, you just replace the Docker with Podman and it works the same. Now, Docker is on Windows and Linux and Mac OS and Podman is just on Linux and possibly on Mac as well. But as we can see here now, it's Podman on Windows installer. So I guess I was wrong. So what's the deal with Docker? Well, firstly, you're going to use the Docker file to build the operating system image. And we, if, if we take a look at it and let's expand it a little bit. This is the Docker file. So this is a recipe with which we create the operating system. So you can think of this file as if you were at a freshly installed machine in the terminal 
and wanted to install a few applications. So start with the from, and this is specifying from which base it's gonna continue. And in this case, I'm gonna start with Fedora 34. This colon separates the name of the uh, distribution and the version. So this is great. So we know that we're pulling from Fedora 34 and all of the repositories that this particular distribution version has. And then we just go through it as we were just installed and sitting behind the freshly installed Fedora 34. We run the DNF update to update its repository and installed a few uh, essential tools just for this virtual machine. We want to use a really specific version. We just download the tar directly from the website, from the ARMS website. Then we just create a folder inside of opt where we're gonna have all the built files. We're gonna extract the downloaded tar file into there. Then we're gonna create a symbolic link from all the binary files into the user local bin and then remove any temp which is gonna remove the, uh, the downloaded tar file. So what we're doing right now is essentially installing the ARM embedded toolchain into the opt directory, into the virtual machines opt directory, and then creating links of all of its executables into the slash user local bin. This way, all of the bin executables like the GCC, the G++, the object copy and object dump tools that are present inside of this toolchain are gonna be available from your path and natively inside of the virtual machine. Then it's a bit uh, unnecessary, but I use it uh, nevertheless. This part will add your username and your group name and your user ID to the virtual machine and add it as a user. This is very useful because all the files created by the virtual machine will be created as if you were the one that has created them. Because it's going to create them with the same user ID and the same group ID and the same style of permissions like you. And that's why uh, this is my preferred way of doing it because it looks like the virtual machine is not really that separate But it's just an extension of your current computer with all the tools encapsulated inside of it And you can see the appeal here you can have many different virtual machines They have many different versions of either the arm toolchain or the operating system platforms or different users that You can use for building your different projects. So if you're some project use one specific uh, version of arm toolchain well, you just download that specific version and install it over here. If you're using some specific packages provided by just some specific versions of different distributions, well, you just specify the different distribution over here and install different tools over here. And that's the appeal of the Docker. Now let's navigate on how to use this Docker efficiently. Specified readme. And here I create a few pros and cons. So the pros is, well, it's minimal dependencies. You only need your Docker tool or Podman, or optionally you can have the make. It all stores all the uh, image files, uh, structures in a separate folder, so it's not polluting your operating system. So you have tons of different uh, Docker images, which, different, uh, which have different compiler versions and different tools. These different versions are not gonna pollute your computer. And it's class platform, except with Podman, but I need to update that because apparently not anymore. Also cons, well, all of the dependencies and tools are installed in your IDE. So natively, if I just open a terminal, the CMake is not installed on my computer, but this is NixOS, so this is a bit special. But for example, if your computer didn't have Make or CMake or the specific ARM non eabi platform, you can see that well, it's not going to work, but you have all the tools inside your container. That's why the IDEs will not love you because they want to try to find the ARM toolchain uh, source files and the headers, but they're not going to be able to find them because they're inside of a container. So for this reason, I recommend the co uh, container for releasing. So when you're working in a group or solo, you provide a container which just builds the project and gives you the binary file. And this is all you need to do to flash on to your microcontroller. And this is great because you just need to create the final executable and it's not really for development purpose. So let's go through with the dependencies. So as you saw before, you have Docker or Podman installed and my make file is also compatible with both. 
You can option use some other tools like Docker Compose or Podman Compose, but I didn't have so much luck with Podman Compose. I guess it's still a work in progress. So the first thing is that I recommend again to use the provided make file, which is a cross platform and cross tool. So for Docker or Podman and Windows and Linux. So we have build container, which will build with the container. And if it detects that it doesn't have the appropriate image uh, built, it will rebuild or build the image from scratch. If you want to go into the uh, container as if it were a Linux computer, then you can type in make shell, which will log in to a Linux shell so you can poke around and test with the tool. The clean image will remove the container and the image and the clean all will just remove the build folder, uh, the container and the image. So let's take a look at that. So if you go into the command line and let's open the make file again and scroll down past this line that says container, we can see quite a few lines of code, but this is all for configuring the container and also adding a little bit of cross-platform support. So in the beginning, I'm getting the user ID, uh, the group ID and the username and the group name. So these are all executed from the shell, except the group one on Windows, the group ID, the GN option doesn't exist. So we have to use the UN for the group as well. So your username will be the same as your group name. And this is all depending on your platform. If so, if you're using Windows or if you're using Linux. Also, a few options are different on Windows. So the path has to have two backslashes instead of just one on Linux. And the work directory again has to have this option dash W instead of just parent working directory. Also on Windows, when we launch the Docker uh, commands, we're gonna have to put in WinPTI in the front. Uh, and on Linux, you don't need to do that. So that's why the Win prefix is set on Windows only and on Linux, it just expands into nothing. Then there are a few settings that you can poke around with. So the, uh, the container tool is either Docker or Podman. So you can choose which one. The container Docker file where we're gonna uh, default to the default Docker file. And here's the image name and the container name. And as in this case, you can see they're quite the same, but you can change them for versioning purposes. Here are a few useful tools. This needs image is just a variable that holds either the value image if the current uh, if the current image that is requested is not yet built or it expands into nothing. The Podman argument is quite the same. If we detect that the tool used is Podman, that we need to apply an additional argument. But if we're not using Podman, so Docker, then this Podman arc is again going to expand into nothing. So here we can see the main command that is run with most of the other commands. So we're gonna run container execute a command in it and then shut down the container. So on Windows, we have to use this prefix that is expanded over here on the top. And on Podwin, we're gonna also have to provide this additional option, but on uh, Docker, it's gonna expand into nothing, as I said before. And here are the working volume and working path. So we're gonna mount our current working directory as if it were a disk into the container so the container can work on it. And then we're gonna CD automatically into this work directory. So when we enter this virtual machine, we're gonna be directly in this the same directory. So we can just type in make and compile the project. So as you can see, all of these uh, uh, later targets are using the container run uh, string, which is common against all of them. So you can see if you just type in build container, it's gonna firstly require that an image is built. And if it is, it's gonna run container run with the bash command on make j and with all the cores that you have on your computer. So this is quite the fastest way you can do it. So this will compile uh, your project inside of the container. The format container is gonna call the make format inside of the container. And the shell is just gonna log in to the container shell. And as you can see, this thing is quite rec recursive. It's actually using the same make file again in the container. So when we run make uh, inside of the container, it's gonna go to this default target, which is all, and it's just gonna build natively inside of the container, which is quite neat, if you ask me. And then the image part is the one that actually builds the image. So it gives it a name, it gives it the Docker file, and it gives it a few extra arguments like the UIDs and the username and group names, which we saw before on top over here. 
and then we have just the clean image and the clean all. We just utilize a few commands that are cross platform on both Podman and Docker. So now let's finally demonstrate how this works. So if I go over here to the to this terminal, uh, let's first clean the repository because the build products are gonna be different. So let's type in make build. container and I can also specify some variable values from here but let's firstly go by default which is gonna be with docker and you can see it was just like that so this was all happening inside of a container so let's go see the command so this is the command that was executed so as you can see that the docker was run on the fedora arm embedded dev which is the image that was built it mounted the current working directory as if it were in slash work dir on the uh, virtual machine and seed it into it. And then a few options and then it ran make J16. And all of these commands that you can see right here were ran from the virtual machine. So if you see the build directory is here and if you seed it into it, we can see that it has been built by me. So it's the same as if I did it on my native computer. And that's because we provided with our own credentials and with the, uh, uh, with the needed permissions uh, so it build it as if it were on our machine and that's great because we have all the files here but here's the catch that's why i didn't uh, say it is good for the de native development if we look at the uh, compile commands and look on which tool is gonna run it's gonna run the arm on the ab gcc from slash user slash local slash bin which is uh, which is just what we told before so if we go into the Docker file, this is where I put all the symbolic links into. So slash user slash local slash bin. So this is where all the links to the executables are, <laughs> but they're not in my computer. So if we go in user local bin, there's nothing in here. So in my <laughs> computer specifically, they're not here at all. So if I were try to use an IDE, it wouldn't find the compiler. So that would be a problem. But other than that, we got our executable and that's the goal. Also, we can clean again and run that compile again with the container tool Podman. So we can just change the type of tool that it's used. So in this case, it's going to use Podman and it's going to work exactly the same. But in this case, it's going to run Podman instead of Docker. And again, to show you that it's cross-platform and in the Windows detection works on everything, let's go into my Win Windows virtual machine, which I've tricked into thinking it's running on actual hardware. So you can see it's reporting that it's running on an actual processor, in this case, Epic Rome. And that's how I was able to install Docker. So I have Docker installed and Windows subsystem for Linux. And I can run make build tainer. And if I run this, it's going to run, as you can see, it put WinPTI in the front because this is required on Linux and also the uh, path directory is different, but everything is working the same. Now, I'm running a virtual machine or a container inside a virtual machine. So, of course, this is going really slow, but to demonstrate, it actually works on a Windows platform. So, please do test this on your computer and if you have any problems, do shoot me a pull request and I'll verify it. So here you can see everything works as expected. And the neat thing is uh, we can do the formatting on the container as well. Because I said I don't have Clang format installed on my Windows machine, but we can run make format container. So now we run the virtual container and Clang format is installed in the container. So that's why we can run Clang a format in the container even though I don't have it installed on my machine which is quite useful if you don't have the all the tools necessary on your native build machine so this is another plus of the container of course there are some other tools like docker compose that you can read into I have all everything described over here so how you can use the docker compose again if you're just using docker uh, without the make file you're gonna have a bit longer command so in this case the build command is quite long for all these additional arguments uh, and of course, don't uh, uh, don't forget to replace the group name is UN instead of GN, as in Linux. So that's one catch. And all the other commands are here as well, if you don't want to use the make in this case. So in this case, the, the minimum uh, 
dependencies are just the Docker tool. Now we just traverse through most of it. I'll leave the Nix part for a future video because it's quite a can of worms and it's quite uh, heavy to take it all. You have to know quite a lot and I'm still in the process of learning so. So we're gonna ignore the flake uh, files, the environment RC and the default .nix files for now. As I mentioned before, Docker Compose is also a tool you can use, so here's the file. And if you're into Docker and you want to use the Docker Compose, then just read the rest of my README and you can follow it along with no problem. We also discussed the make file, readmes and the git ignore files, so we practically covered everything in this repository. The one last thing I want to touch upon on is the extra tooltips and extra code tips. So we can click on this link. It gives us to the tools.md. And these are some of the tools that, again, as I said before, I've returned to from time to time and I forget a few options. So in this case, object dump is a useful tool for viewing parts of your binary or your executable. So .o files and .l files or also the .bin files. And uh, this command has a few options and it also comes with the ARM uh, uh, toolchain. And these are a few options and a few example sections. So if I want to inspect some binary in a few sections or some executables, then I'm gonna dump the entire file like this. So let's test this. So arm non yabby object dump. And this is an appropriate command. And I pipe all the results into less. Here I can inspect the actual uh, binary and actual assembly extractions of the text section, which is a section that holds all of the code. And we want to find the function called project main. We can do so like this. So this is where it's called and this is where it's defined. So we can see all the insights of the project main. So this is this command that is used over here, but in this case it's viewing raw data, but in my case I'm viewing the text data. The read delve is quite a similar command, but it has a few extra options, but I use them both. And uh, this one is mo must help with the sections. So if you're using the arm non eab read elf, and I'm gonna use the s command. Oh, and I have to provide it with the appropriate path. Come on. Here I'm viewing all the sections of this executable. So these are different parts in memory that are used for making this project work. So here we have the interrupt table, the functions, the read-only data, we have the initial values for all the global variables and the zero initialized global variables and stuff like that. So this is useful when you're debugging and it's also an idea for a future video as well. Here I have also a few examples on how to use this tool along with hexdump, which is useful when you're uh, viewing the raw binary. So you can use hexdump and it's installed on most Linux distributions with the option C. And if we go into the build and firmware.bin and let's also pipe it to less, we can see the raw contents of the binary. And here we have it in hex, so that's why I call hex dump. And here we have in a string view. So if you were to traverse this file, you will somewhere find also the string. So here you see the hello world constant, which is saved in this file. So this is the read-only data part of this file. So this is how you can sometimes inspect if some variables or some data is stored in the correct part of the memory. So this is the hex dump tool. And let's lastly see the extra code tips. So the extra code tips describes a few compiler directives that you can use inside of your code to change and modify some of the settings of the compiler at runtime. So here I have a little bit of explanation of pragmas. So pragmas are these different compiler directives that you've seen from the part uh, uh, here and there. And the pragma ones, you've seen it more than once. Uh, and this is an unofficial replacement for the header uh, include correction. We can also use it as a command with some prefix in order to instruct on compiler to do something differently. So in this case, uh, if you have a few options that you have to load, like in this case, we want to enable vformat as an error. In this case, we can from this line on use this option and then we just revert to the back to the previous settings.
or this is the one that I've been using for most of the time, sometimes you want to change the optimization level for just a part of the code. And this works only for whole functions, so make sure you know that. But in this case, I save the current state of the optimization variables. I change the O level to O0, so I disable all of the optimizations just for this function, and then I restore the previous settings. So that way, I can make sure that this function is gonna be intact in the final bi uh, binary, and it's gonna look like exactly as it looks like now in C. And there are some other uh, gotchas in here for the uh, for the explanation of the system headers and warnings that you're gonna get. So I advise you to have a look at these files as well. And if you have some ideas or some additions for these files, please uh, shoot me a pull request and I'll review it with no problem. So that's about it for these repositories. The only thing I didn't mention are the NICs, but you, I also have a readme over here, so you can go over it and uh, look at it, what I've written about it. Uh, this is quite a complex topic, but other than that, this is everything in this repository. I hope it makes sense. Uh, I hope I gave a good introduction. So the goal is that you can just clone this repository, remove everything you don't need. So if you're not using containerization, there you go. A bunch of files get removed. If you're not using Nix, like four or five files get removed. And also the make file. If you're not using the container, again, everything from here down can be removed. And if you're not using any of these flashing commands, then you can remove these as well. And also prune this depending on if you're using Windows or Linux. So this is really dynamic. So you can just change this. And in future videos, I'll create one. We're gonna use this exact repository in this exact state in order to create a dummy repository. And again, thanks for watching. If you have some ideas or questions, just comment it down below. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye.